Hello everyone, good evening. Welcome to the session all of you. I hope you immense love towards chemistry is what brought me into teaching. In the six years of my teaching experience, I got to handle more than 6,000 students of class 10 and 12 CBSC boards. And today I'm here to spend some time with all of you guys regarding metals and non-metals. In fact, we are going to talk about all the key concepts of metals and non-metals and learn amazing shortcuts to crack it. Well, a few of you might be wondering that we already have studied metals and non-metals before. We have learned it through some other source. Then what is the speciality now? Yes, there is a speciality now and that speciality is guys, we are going to talk about such important concepts which are very important and frequently seen in the previous year board examinations. And along with learning the concepts and practicing these questions, we are also going to get some amazing tips throughout the session related to the topic whenever we are discussing it. And there is a surprise for all of you. And that surprise will be revealed at some point of time throughout, I mean, at some point of time in the session. Yeah, are you all ready then? Shall we start? Well, let us start the session with the help of a puzzle which will be on the screen in a few seconds. But before that, let me tell you something. Once I explain how to answer the puzzle or once I explain the scenario, you will have only 30 seconds of time to answer that question. Okay, so now there we go with the puzzle. Let me quickly tell you what it is about. There are four metals A, B, C, D, which are exposed to different metallic salt solutions as shown here at the top of the table. And here is their behavior. So for example, if you talk about metal A, when it's reacted with iron sulfate, it doesn't show any reaction. And metal A, when it is exposed to copper sulfate, undergoes displacement. Then what about metal B? Metal B in presence of iron sulfate undergoes displacement. But the question now is, what could be its behavior in presence of copper sulfate? So, your time starts now. You have 30 seconds of time to answer this. Hurry up. What is behavior of metal B when it is exposed to a solution of copper sulfate? Hurry up guys. You can answer through the chart. If you are wondering where to answer and how to answer, please type it in the chart. Hurry up. That's great. I already see many of your responses and a few of you are correct as well. Not a few. Many of you are correct and a few of you are not. That's good. Good, good, good. Hurry up, hurry up. You have 10 seconds of time now. Very good. All right. A few of you are just going wrong due to some slight confusion, I believe. Okay. Okay, the question time ends in three seconds. Two, one. It's time. Stop. Hold on. Well, coming to the answer of this question, guys, how to answer this? Based on which principle can we answer this question? Based on reactivity series. Isn't it? This is not the first time we are talking about reactivity series, isn't it? Reactivity series is the order of metals with respect to their react reaction capacity. For example, take a look at the look at this list, which is consisting of potassium, sodium, lithium, calcium, magnesium, goes on till platinum. Yeah. In this list, the top metals like potassium, sodium are most reactive and the most bottom metals like potassium, sorry, platinum and gold are least reactive. And this, re this reactivity series is constructed based on the concept of electropositivity. And now we have to answer this question based on reactivity series itself. Of course, you can try doing it based on other concepts also. But if you want to answer this in no time, you can make use of reactivity series. Let me tell you how. For that, read the question one more time. When you have a metal A and it's not undergoing any reaction with iron, but undergoing a reaction with copper, that means metal A is less reactive than iron and it is not able to displace iron. According to the rules of displacement, only more reactive metal will be able to displace less reactive metal, isn't it? 
So if A is not able to displace iron, it should be something which is less reactive than iron. Apply the same principle to metal B as well. Metal B is undergoing displacement with iron sulphate. Look at the position of iron sulphate here. There we go. Iron sulphate is here. And if metal B is able to displace iron sulphate, that means the position of metal B is above iron. It's more reactive than iron, isn't it? Now, the question is, if B can displace copper sulphate or it cannot displace, does it show a reaction or does not show any reaction? Let us understand the, that with the help of same series. Where is copper? Copper is here. And copper is less reactive than iron. We are talking about a metal which is more reactive than iron. And that metal is able to displace iron. Obviously, it will be able to displace copper also which is less reactive than iron. Isn't it? So, when you expose metal B to a solution of copper sulphate which is less reactive than its capacity, what should be expected? The expected observation should be a displacement reaction. Because B is obviously more reactive, so it undergoes displacement, isn't it? See how easily can we answer this question if we know reactivity series. If we know the perfect hearting, potassium, sodium, lithium, magnesium, calcium. So you see, actually it's not interesting to memorize in that way. So let's make it interesting by constructing a statement me a careless zebra instead learn how copper saves gold okay please stop calling me a careless zebra and instead learn how copper saves gold did you get it in fact, the statement doesn't have any sense. It's perfectly senseless. But then it's very interesting and funny to read through and memorize, isn't it? And with the help of the statement, we can also recall reactivity series. And if you're surprised how, I'll tell you. Look at the first letter of each word of the statement, please. The first word of first letter indicates potassium. S of stop, sodium. Calcium, M, Magnesium. This is where you have to concentrate. M here indicates Magnesium, not Manganese. Okay? And then A, Aluminium. C again. Calcium already has come. What is the C for? It's for Carbon. You know why Carbon is used here? Carbon is a non-metal. But still we are using it in the metal reactivity series. Why? Because it's a sort of standard to measure reactivity. All the metals above carbon are active metals and all the metals next to carbon, below carbon are moderately reactive or slowly reactive metals. This is only for making a standard, not more than that. If you don't want, you can remove carbon also. It's perfectly fine. Okay. Now, next one, zebra, zinc, instead, iron, learn, let, how, hydrogen, a non-metal, again a standard, copper. Copper saves. S here represents silver. Yeah, you have to focus on the S which comes first, which is for sodium, comes with, I mean, the S which comes next is for silver. You have to remember this, okay? And then is gold. After gold, you can also add platinum and tungsten, but then they are not related to our syllabus, so I have stopped it here, okay? So coming back to the statement, please stop calling me a careless zebra. Instead, learn how copper saves gold, yeah? If you memorize the statement, with the help of the statement, you will be able to recall reactivity series very, very, very easily. So come on, guys, make a note of it and say it for three times. Memorize it right now because I'm going to ask you another question based on reactivity series. And I hope you all will be ready to answer this question without watching the series. Okay, just by keeping it in mind, you should be able to answer this question. Are you all ready? Yes, that's good. Now. The other question is also from the same puzzle. Let me ask you, which question is it? What is that question? Okay. So now we have spoken about behavior of B in iron sulfate, copper sulfate, and it's already given about zinc sulfate. Now tell me, using reactivity series, tell me out of A and B, which is more reactive and which is less? 
Your time starts now. You have 30 seconds of time and I'm asking you out of A and B, which is more reactive and which is less reactive. And you should know the reason as well. Just don't say it by fluke. Okay, say either A or B. Okay, you know, you know that sometimes in answering multiple choice questions, right? Not everyone, but a few of you. Yeah, what is that? Pinky, pinky, ponky, for the harder donkey, blah, blah, blah. And then find the answer somehow by fluke. Yeah, don't do it here. So try to relate this to reactivity series. I'm not showing you the series. I'm not showing you the table. You have to recall it with the help of the statement. Please stop calling me a careless zebra. Instead, try learning how copper saves gold. And then you have to answer this question. You're almost done with your time. You already have exhausted your time. 30 seconds. You have a few seconds left now. Hurry up. I'm waiting for your answer. Let me check the chat box as well. That's great. It's good. I mean, it feels exciting to see the multiple choice answers. Like it will be either A, 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 A or B, 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 B in the chat, right? Well, coming back, that's done, guys. Stop, stop, stop. Because you have exhausted all the time given to answer this question. Now it's my turn, okay? So listen to the answer first and then let us see how many of you were correct and how many of you are not, okay? So coming back, out of A and B, which is more reactive and which is less reactive. You want to know how to answer this question? Then you have to answer this based on reactivity series. See, you already knew that metal B is more reactive than iron. Yeah, it's more reactive than iron because it's performing a displacement reaction there. And metal A is not showing any reaction. That's also given in the table. Yeah, if A is not reacting with iron, that means it is less reactive than iron. Yeah, and if B is undergoing displacement, that means it is more reactive than iron. You have iron and B is less reactive. Sorry, B is more reactive than iron and A is less reactive. Now, if you compare reactivity of A and B, which is more? Obviously, B is more reactive. The answer for this question is B is more reactive than A. Yeah, so see how reactivity series is helpful. 50% possibility of both exam questions from this chapter are around reactivity series. They'll not directly ask you to write, write reactivity series. They'll give you questions in and around this topic. If the paper is very easy and you got too lucky, the questions will be like, arrange the following elements based on reactivity series. They'll give you some four or five elements and you got to arrange them. It's very simple. And sometimes when we get unlucky, if the paper is tough, the questions like this would appear. And in order to answer this question, you need reasoning skills along with reactivity series. Okay? Yes? So are we clear so far? We are talking about a few questions and reactivity series. And now we are getting into some other important question. Again, in both point of view, obviously. Yeah? So I'll just show you the question. And I'll give you 10 seconds of time to think about the question. Yeah? There you go with the question on the screen. Why does calcium float on water? Why do you think calcium floats on water? Commonly, when we add maybe an ice cube to a beaker of water, it floats. And we all know the reason behind it. Anomalous expansion, because it has less density, it floats. We just throw a stone or a pebble into water, it sinks, because it has high density. It's the same reason applied here also. Why does calcium float on water? Because it has less density than water. Are you sure? I see some of you saying that also. <laughs> Anyways, coming back, let me complete the question. Why does calcium float on water after some time? After some time of adding it to water. Initially, when you add calcium, it doesn't start floating. If it initially starts to float, then you may think of the concept of molecular mass and the density and all that. But then, initially it doesn't. Initially it just sinks. Do you see this image here? A uh, small chunk. Assume that to be the chunk of calcium, the piece of calcium. And now piece of calcium here sinks down initially. Proving that it has more. That's good. A few of you have rightly mentioned that it is due to its reactivity. Yes. When we add calcium to water, it undergoes reaction. But then before that, we need to recall a few points about calcium. Calcium is one of the active metal of the reactivity series. Remember, please stop calling the third metal. The third metal is 
calcium right so calcium is one of the active metal and when it is added to water h2o it leads to a reaction which is obviously a displacement reaction i hope you all know this shortcut right in the reactant or on the side of reactants if you have two cations and two anions guys that will be a double displacement reaction but if you have two cations and one anion it means you are going to have a single displacement mechanism shown there okay so here you have calcium and h plus two cations only oxygen is anion so it has to be single displacement and this displacement is possible perfectly because calcium is more reactive than hydrogen calcium comes first in the reactivity series so it will be able to displace hydrogen leading to formation of calcium hydroxide and hydrogen look at the physical states here calcium is a solid water obviously it's in liquid physical state at room temperature calcium oxide is also solid but then hydrogen is a gas because hydrogen is a gas what does it do what if hydrogen is a gas why are we talking about it because hydrogen is the one which is playing the key role in floating of calcium let me tell you something how many of you remember playing with those uh, balloons filled with hydrogen have you ever played the the balloons we commonly blow them with co2 we just uh, blow them otherwise we fill co2 in the balloons with the help of a machine otherwise there are some special cases where we fill in hydrogen gas in the bubbles and those bubbles are very special because once you leave them they are just gone up into the sky and they never come back isn't it yeah have you experienced it ever in your childhood yeah have you ever cried for those balloons that you missed they went up in the sky and they never came back anyways why does it happen because the balloons are filled with hydrogen okay let them be filled with hydrogen when i blow a balloon with carbon dioxide of my mouth and when i leave it it doesn't go up into the sky it just falls down it just settles down at the bottom notice it if you want do it and notice it and if you fill it uh, fill the balloon with hydrogen gas and if you leave it it just escapes out it just flies up why is it happening because hydrogen is the heaviest element isn't it yeah is it because hydrogen is heaviest it's not that's because hydrogen is lightest element hydrogen is the lightest element that it has less density than air around us and once you leave the balloon of hydrogen it's like it tries to go to the top and settle down yeah settle there not down settle there at the top yeah and the same is applied here as well hydrogen because it is very lightest it has less density than water and it wants to rise up but hydrogen bubbles which are formed here they will not be able to rise up independently and they just get stuck to the outer surface of calcium as a result of which the entire mass of calcium would be reduced isn't it because hydrogen bubbles are stuck to the outer surface of calcium the calcium after a while of the reaction starts floating into the water and moreover there is one more advantage to calcium here that advantage is as time passes the mass of calcium is reducing right that's why i said mass of calcium is reducing and it's rising up along with hydrogen being stuck to the outer surface mass reduces because it's undergoing reaction calcium oxide is not stuck to calcium anymore it is just dissolving into water it is soluble in water it's an alkali right and calcium mass reduces and hydrogen is also stuck to it all the bubbles of hydrogen carry the chunk of calcium top into the water that's why calcium starts floating after a while yes are we clear so why does calcium float on water after it started to react that's because as a result of reaction hydrogen gas is produced which will be in form of bubbles inside the water and it gets stuck to the outer surface of the calcium and rises the calcium also up but here we forgot one point i said right when you blow balloons with carbon dioxide and leave them they just settle down to the ground why why does it happen are you still confused with the answer it happens because carbon dioxide is heavy than air mass of one mole of carbon dioxide is 44 grams and it's heavier than actual air around us that's why it settles down carbon dioxide commonly settles down at the bottom to the ground yes 
right guys so coming back we are talking about reactivity series and we are discussing all those important questions related to reactivity series around reactivity series which have come in the previous year board exams this question calcium also has appeared twice in the past eight year question papers if you want you can go check well now if we are clear so far can we go ahead yeah shall we take one more interesting question ready ready just fine ready that's good that's good a few of you seem to be ready but then a few of you are not i don't see your responses well there we go with another question on the screen and i want you to answer this question can we dissolve gold using an acid i read the question and i want to be clear about the question can we dissolve gold using an acid you have 10 seconds yes or no just say yes or no you should be knowing the reason again don't do that inky pinky ponky okay yeah yes or no most of you say yes and most of you again say no it's a mixture of responses yes and no yes and no yes and no okay that's fine then okay <laughs> yes and no again i can't determine the ratio right now because it's a, it seems like a perfect mixture well anyways coming back can we dissolve gold using an acid few of you said yes we can dissolve okay if we can dissolve fine be there i'm coming to you and i'm talking about those who said no we cannot dissolve gold with an acid i have second question for you and that question will be on the screen now in spite of saying this as a question i would say it as a story read through it a man went to uh, a man went door to door posing as a goldsmith he promised to bring back the glitter of the gold ornaments even after they are dull even after they have got dull dull shade and an unsus unsuspecting lady gave a set of gold bangles to him which he dipped in a particular solution and once he has taken it out the gold ornament started to glitter but then unfortunately the mass was drastically reduced what was that solution can you tell me guys who have said that an acid cannot dissolve gold can you please answer this question and rest of you if you want to answer even you can okay but specifically those who have chosen no for the last question can you answer this why i want the reason also take time type it in that's okay but then i want the reason also okay interesting reasons would be found for this question i believe anyways so here surprising answers in fact here the goldsmith is dipping the gold ornaments which are very old and dull into a particular solution and once he is taking back they are shining like something but then the mass is reduced what magic is happening when he has dipped gold ornament into the solution mass is reducing what does it mean it obviously means that some some quantity of gold is the salt isn't it it's already gone into the solution that's why the resultant gold is less by quantity less by its mass isn't it so what is that solution that is dissolving gold how many of you do think it's pure and plain water anyone in the class to my surprise there are some people okay now it can't be water definitely it can't be water if that is the case every day when you take bath wearing some gold ring or something it should be gone right but it's not happening so it's not water but then what that solution is let's talk about this concept by cracking the first question that i asked you can we dissolve gold by an acid with the help of an acid in fact answer for this question is we can't dissolve gold using an acid look at this question i'm talking about one acid not talking about a mixture or whatever i'm talking about one acid but acid cannot dissolve gold why remember that reactivity series learn how copper saves gold at the end gold comes at the end isn't it and then comes platinum etc forget about it but gold comes almost at the end which means gold is least to reactive and now if you want some acid say hcl or h2so4 or hno3 or take phosphoric acid or whatever you want it to react what do you expect you expect hydrogen to be displaced by gold isn't it yeah gold is the least reactive metal and hydrogen falls somewhere in between can gold displace hydrogen it doesn't have that guts gold 
world is less reactive but it can't fight against any hydrogen atom of any mineral acid so gold doesn't react with acids and it can't be dissolved easily but then what does goldsmith is using is it a magic it's not magic it's chemistry again and he is using a mixture of acid i said one acid cannot dissolve but a mixture of acids can dissolve and which mixture of acids he is using he is using a mixture of acids which contain 1 is to 3 ratio of h NO3 and HCl in concentrated forms. One part of HNO3 and three parts of HCl in concentrated form. When they are mixed up with each other, they form a solution, and that solution is called as aqua regia. Aqua regia is commonly known as royal water. Since it is royal water, we can't drink it. Using aqua regia. to clean up the gold when he immerses gold ornament into aqua regia all the top layers of gold are dissolved and that dissolved gold particles are in the aqua regia solution and once he takes up the gold out of the solution the freshly subjected or exposed new layer of gold particles would be there and freshly cut layer of any metal obviously is lustrous and especially precious metals like gold silver platinum are super lustrous that's why they are precious right yeah so here he is using aqua regia and after using aqua regia after dipping a gold ornament into aqua regia there will be particles of gold in it in fact literally in the markets in the gold market goldsmith when we give gold ornaments or silver ornaments to be washed or to be what to say to be polished they dip it into uh, respective aqua regia if it is gold silver acids also will do normal acids also will do and they don't throw off those acidic or aqua regia solutions soon after they clean because they can process it with further reagents in order to acquire the particles of gold or silver which is obviously beneficial to them right yeah so washing or polishing of gold silver ornaments we will end up losing some mass of gold and silver so we shouldn't do it too frequently we should do it whenever is needed so now coming back gold can be dissolved not by an acid but by a mixture of acids which is called as aqua regia 1 is to 3 combination of concentrated hno3 and hcl right guys yes so now how did you get to know that gold doesn't react with acid okay how based on obviously reactivity series see how important it is this question is also one of the frequently found question so now this way there are many questions based on reactivity series around reactivity series which are really really helpful in exam point of view yeah so i hope you guys are following it's been a lot of chemistry questions now let me ask you one other interesting question okay yeah ready for the question it's a generalized question since we are talking about gold and gold ornaments let me ask you this question now do you think gold can be oxidized gold can it be oxidized i hope i mean i hope you all know rusting corrosion concept you must have done it in chapter 1 class 10 cbsc if not in class 7 cbsc rusting or corrosion oxidation of metals like silver iron copper etc yeah that way can gold also be oxidized can it be rusted can it corrode yes or no? just say yes or no mm -hmm. most of you say no which is um, actually correct but there is a condition applied i'll be explaining the condition in a while well 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 gold cannot be oxidized according to most of you in the class but could be oxidized according to a few of you and i have another linking question here and the question will be on the screen now with the help of an image the question is displayed just take a look at the question and tell me your view about this i hope you are able to see the image on the screen there is an image on the right hand side of a gold chain which looks relatively dull than the new gold ornaments if you say that gold cannot oxidize or gold does not get corroded in presence of atmospheric oxygen then how is this happening why why are new gold ornaments and why the old gold ornaments do not look alike the new ones obviously do shine old ones have some dull shade why is it if gold is not getting oxidized can somebody help me understand this 
Yeah, can somebody help me understand this? My gold ornaments are never too shiny as they were when I bought them. They are day by day getting dull, dull and dull shade. Not like... Let me break this ambiguous question. They are mixtures. They are not pure. They are not 100% pure. You might have heard about this term, right? 22 karat gold, 18 karat gold, 24 karat gold. What are that? Is that carrot the real carrot which we eat? Which has vitamin A, orange in color? Not exactly, right? What is that carrot? The carrot is the symbol for purity of gold. Generally, the gold coins and gold biscuits, which are not jewels or ornaments, are 24 carat, which means they are utmost pure form of gold that we can get. And the 22 carat gold and 18 carat gold that we use to make ornaments or jewels or articles are mixture of gold and silver or gold and copper. They are never pure gold. Why are we buying impure gold if that is the case? Why? Any reason? Can somebody help me understand this reason now then? What is the reason that we are buying gold ornaments which are not 100% gold? What is the reason? Because, very good, a few of you are amazingly correct. Because gold is highly malleable and in fact 100% pure form of gold can cannot be made into some stable mold. So, making jewelry out of the gold ornaments, out of the gold which is 100% pure is almost not possible. And now since we are talking about gold which is precious, let me give you one of the precious piece of information as well. That's the surprise of the class. Are you all ready for it then? Shall I open it? Yeah? Well guys, so before we could talk about the surprise, let me just ask you one question. And the question is, how many of you have learned something out of this session? We are here from past some 30 minutes or so, right? Have you learned perfectly about the reactivity series? And could you learn some extra points about the chapter metals and non-metals? Yes, could you? That's great if you could have learned. If you have learnt it, that's great. But then, are you someone who is looking for an amazing opportunity to conquer metals and non-metals in both point of view and a little ahead of it as well? Are you trying to learn metals and non-metals in such a way that it's easy, it's fun learning and it also comes with some of the value add-ons like learning the real-time applications of metals and non-metals and learning the most exceptional properties of metals and non-metals. If you are someone who is going to, I mean, who is aspiring to learn about metals and non-metals that way, I have a news for you. Vedantu is launching a modular course only for the chapter metals and non-metals, which is starting from 11th of this month. And in this chapter, we are going to talk about the entire metals and non-metals chapter in a different way, at a different level. Not just learning from NCRT, please, but also learning it in a practical application manner. As in, when you talk about metals and non-metals, when you learn about them, not just learning it for the sake of marks, but learning it for the sake of understanding happens here. So I'm the one who will be dealing with this modular course and I'll be the one who will be taking you to A to Z all essential elements and info of this chapter and this course is starting in two days it will be starting from 11th of this month and all together there are 10 classes allotted for this chapter so if you are someone who is looking to join this course i'll be giving you a link in a while please do Click on the link, please do use the link to get redirected. And now coming back to the gold question that we were talking of. Yes, the gold ornaments which we use are not 100% gold, but they are a mixture of copper or silver. And this copper or silver are not non-corroding metals, right? Copper and silver, they undergo corrosion, they get oxidized. Of course, slowly, but then they get oxidized. 
and because of this copper or silver present in the gold ornaments they get oxidized gradually as the time passes they slowly react with atmospheric oxygen and they turn their color they change their color if it is silver the color is grayish black and if it is copper some greenish color dirty green or dull green colored tinge will be seen in the gold ornament so it's not gold getting oxidized over there but then what's it it is the copper or the silver component of gold ornament which is getting oxidized yeah yes well guys so we are done with the question yes gold does not get oxidized but the gold ornaments do show that oxidation process because they do consist of either copper or silver but I have one more question here why only copper or silver i can use some iron sodium aluminium right why only copper or silver any idea can you share your ideas with me on this any idea why it is only copper or silver but why not sodium lithium potassium and other metals of the reactivity series because it's cheap silver is not very cheap it's expensive too okay because of that's a good example well guys well we can't use active metals here see if in spite of using copper and silver if you are using metal like aluminium or metals like calcium you know what happens they also get reacted but the speed of the reactivity is higher than copper and silver right out of series we have a few metals which are too reactive if you use two reactive metals to make jewels in spite of getting corroded or oxidized in two years of time they get they get it done in two months or two days of time itself right which is actually not advantageous so when we have to mix up when we have to make an alloy we need to ensure that we are using the metals which are least corrosive which are least reactive that's why we use either copper or silver over here and copper or silver addition also enables this all molds or different shapes to be acquired easily because 100% pure form of gold is highly malleable it's not too hard or strong it's highly malleable right guys so we are talking about reactivity series and we have almost covered some 5 to 7 both important questions this all the questions directly or indirectly appear in the previous years and expected this year also so i'm sure you must be making note of this all important points that we are discussing today so initially we spoke about the reactivity series and then we solved the puzzle two questions based on puzzle and why does calcium float on water yes and then we also spoke about if gold can be dissolved in presence of an acid which is not obviously we spoke about aqua regia we spoke about that goldsmith story and the question and this the question on the screen right yeah so now let's take one more interesting question and let us see if we are able to answer that question in fact let me see if you are able to answer this answer that question in due time and before that let me just add one point to the course details here in the modular codes of metals and non metals which is being to be i mean which is going to be conducted at vedantu from 11th of this month we are going to have 10 allotted sessions and these 10 sessions when i say session one session means one hour okay so you are going to spend 10 hours of time in form of multiple sessions in order to study this chapter and in these 10 sessions you will not only be getting conceptual knowledge but you will also be acquiring some practical knowledge and along with that you know what the best part is you don't need to worry about the important questions from the chapter you don't need to worry about the summary of the chapter you don't need to worry about the notes of the chapter you don't need to worry about anything any content related to the chapter because i'm going to give you everything as a package okay once you are into the course you will be added to my whatsapp group i have a whatsapp group dedicated to this modular course and i already have students in that and you will be added to that group where in we will be sharing the content we will be sharing the knowledge and i will be answering your doubts related to this chapter and also i'll be helping you with regard to your board exam preparation so that's one plus point you get 
once you enroll into this modular course of 10 hours and there is one other best part also which i'll tell you after a while before that let's look into one more question which will be on the screen now i hope you see the question on the screen hydrogen is not a metal but it has been assigned a place in the reactivity series of metals it's a statement but the question here is why does it happen i already have told you this point in our session today and i want to see how many of you actually were really alert in the session and how many of you would be able to answer this question now so show it to me how many of you are really conscious and how many of you know the answer just let me know through the chat hurry up why is hydrogen placed in the reactivity series even though it's not a metal reactivity series which we have studied is for metals right but still we have it in non uh, we still have a non metal like hydrogen in the series why the reason that's good that's good quick responses keep it up we have hydrogen over there point number 1 as a comparison the electrode potential of hydrogen is zero and above hydrogen reactive and below hydrogen very less reactive metals but you know one more point behind this hydrogen is a non metal no doubt about it but then along with being a non metal it also has a few properties of electropositive elements like hydrogen can lose electron to form h plus ion which is a proton and this tendency of losing electrons is called as electropositivity and which is a characteristic of metals because hydrogen has that exceptional quality of showing electropositivity being non metal we place it in the metallic series that's another reason okay so two reasons behind placing hydrogen in metal reactivity series reason number 1 is hydrogen is a state of comparison and two is hydrogen has electropositivity also along with electronegativity and that's why we use hydrogen also as a part of reactivity series right guys so now as i told you there is one other advantage of the modular course which is going to happen at vedantu from 11th of this month one advantage you're going to master the chapter metals and non-metals in my supervision and otherwise other than that you are also going to get the entire bundle of content with the summary important questions frequently asked questions and the important points related with chapter and other than that you have another advantage also and if you want to know what that another advantage is that's nothing but being given frequent assignments and test after every class you will be shared one set of assignments with the help of which you will be able to test your knowledge after the class and any sort of doubts or confusion that you acquired you can replay the session and watch because all the sessions that happen at vedantu are perfectly recorded moreover you also will be able to download the session notes like the way i'm using the slides here i'm writing on the slides you will be able to download all this stuff as a pdf so that you can watch the slides when you prepare your notes when you study for your exam so you are getting the content you are getting the replay session option and you are also getting download the session notes option is it not nice you know what when i was a student we never had this all facilities you guys are too lucky too lucky that you have this all options and moreover you you will be a part of teachers whatsapp group here in this modular course you will be added to my whatsapp group we can always have exhausting discussions about chemistry and metals and non-metals well so these are the benefits and there is one other benefit as well before which i want to ask you another question and that question is it's a very simple question okay and that question is aluminium in reactivity series reactivity series of metals that we spoke about aluminium falls into the top list as an it's one of the active metal yeah you have a doubt hold on recall the statement which which is helping us to memorize reactivity series please stop calling me a careless zebra please stop calling me a careless zebra right what does it a indicate 
A is nothing but aluminium. Aluminium is in the initial stages of the series, which means it's very active. Aluminium is an active metal. But then why do we use aluminium utensils in the kitchen? Now, aluminium is active. There is a scope that it gets oxidized with the atmosphere and it gets corroded, rusted, loses its physical properties, shine and everything. Isn't it? But still we use aluminium utensils. They are cheap and they are most used. What is the reason? Can anyone in the class answer this question? What is the reason behind using aluminium in order to make utensils in the kitchen? I already see responses. That's good, guys. That's good. You have been quick enough. Keep it up. That's good. That's good. Keep it up. Well, coming back to the answer, aluminium being an active metal, still it is used in manufacturing utensils because aluminium has a special property i'll show you what does what it is okay so assume that this is the aluminium utensil that you are talking about it is active and no doubt it undergoes oxidation but then when it is undergoing oxidation the top layer particles of aluminium they react with oxygen and they lead to formation of aluminium oxide yeah and once they form aluminium oxide, they will just block the surface as in they don't let any more oxygen to penetrate into the aluminium particles anymore. So, aluminium oxide layer which is formed over here is acting as a barrier between aluminium and atmospheric oxygen. Thus, will not let any further oxidation of aluminium happen and we call this process as tarnishing we call this process as tarnishing tarnishing is exhibited by aluminium not only by aluminium a few more metals also do exhibit because of which furthermore layers of aluminium cannot be oxidized and it stops with the top layer because top layer of aluminium oxide which is formed acts as a barrier between atmosphere and bottom layers of aluminium right that's good i see a few of you being really very smart and i appreciate you guys well as i said there is one more news about the modular codes and that one more news is there you go with the link i'll first give you the link and you will see the news when you click on the link the link is vdnt dot in slash metal quickly type it in in this i mean type it in the search bar now right now and you know right it is https before vdnt dot in that's quite obvious so vdnt dot in slash metal take down this link and just click it in the search bar meanwhile i'll also do it okay and when you click on the link this is the page that you will be redirected to you will be redirected to a codes page of metals and non-metals. It is the modular codes page where we have all the discussion that we spoke about so far. Like this is taken by me. I will be the one who will be taking you through metals and non-metals from A to Z. Starting from explaining the concept, having discussions and interactions and clearing your doubts both in the session and outside the session through WhatsApp making sure you all get the content bundle with the summary notes short notes and important points along with frequently asked and important questions ncrt solutions is always given i don't need to tell about it specially and that all is going to happen in 10 hours of time which would be divided into a few sessions each session probably would be one and a half hour okay and this course if you are if you are enrolling for this course individually without attending this webinar, you would have to pay 14 double line. But then now because you had been so nice and you had been too lovely, spent one hour approximately of time, you are given an opportunity to join me in this course of modular metals and non-metals at only four double line i hope you see it once you log on to this page click on enroll now button which will redirect you to a new page where you can make the payment and this link and the code or this coupon code is applicable only for a few hours of time not more than that so 
I believe that the most genuine student who I, who is I mean whoever are aspiring to learn metals and non-metals in a different level, along with all the add-ons, would enroll for it. So the classes are starting at 11 June. So make sure you don't get late. So make sure you make use of this opportunity and enroll into the course. Well, one more thing I wanted to tell you is not only the content but after you are done with the class you are done with the assignment you also will be given definite test objective and subjective to make sure for me that's for me to know what your learning outcome is that means your learning your learning processes all together monitored right from the beginning till the end right so first step is you will be taught a lecture and then is the assignment and then you will be given the notes you will go through it you will learn it and then you will take the test whatever you are missing in the test you again come back revise again take another test right it's a regular process which happens at Vedantu and which is very systematic and help you to crack your CBSE board exams like a pro so I repeat this modular course of metals and non-metals is starting at, I mean starting on 11th August 11th of this month and this course will have limited number of seats let me show you how many seats yeah so this course will be having limited number of seats it is 10 seats available right now so start booking and I hope to see you all in the modular course which is starting at 11th okay and now coming back coming back to our actual discussion we were talking about reactivity series and all that right so now let me ask you one more question before that let me summarize what did we do in today's class we started off with reactivity series and then we have discussed around nine questions based on reactivity series direct or indirect questions and later we spoke about the modular course which is going to start at Vedantu from 11th of this month and which you can enroll only at 499 because you have spent this one hour of time here in this webinar. Well, and now I have another question for all of you and this question is for me to understand your learning outcome. This is for me to understand if you have understood what I said so far or not okay and this is a sort of homework you would have to answer this question at my whatsapp number or you have to write a mail to me otherwise you can also text message me okay so there you go with the question on the screen let's read through it a student took four test tubes one two three and four containing aluminium sulfate copper sulfate ferrous sulfate and zinc sulfate solutions respectively Four test tubes, each of it containing each of the solution, metallic salt solution. And now he has placed an iron strip in each of them. So the metal which he has introduced here is iron. Okay. Now, what would be the observation in all these four containers? Especially in which container or in which test tube would you be able to find some brown deposit? It could be one test tube or two test tubes. So now I want you to answer this question. Let me see who answers first. Where will you answer? As I told you, you can WhatsApp this answer at this number. So well guys, this is my WhatsApp number. You can reach me out to answer this question first and after that you will also reach me out for any sort of help in enrolling modular codes metals and non-metals at Vedantu. So let me see who answers it first. You can also write a mail to this mail id which I am writing it here. So hurry up. Well let me see who answers it first and well guys that was I believe that was a helpful discussion that we have today and I hope to see you all in my modular codes. As you know, there are only 10 seats available, only limited count of students that we have in each session is a constraint here. So hurry up, ensure that you enroll, you make use of this opportunity so that you can learn metals and non-metals like a master. I'll see you all in my modular codes. Take care everyone.